populism question is central to understanding kind of libertarianism right now in 2023. We had this conversation, uh, we went into this topic with Dave Smith on the first episode of the show. Um, and I wanted to just play a little bit of Dave's argument. He, he's very much in the pro-populism camp. And this is a debate that stretches back to kind of the beginnings of modern American libertarianism. Uh, let's have, I want to have Dave articulate his case for libertarian populism and then kind of delve a little more deeply into this. So let's roll that. Yes. Oh, I'm a big believer in the Rothbardian kind of like populist idea that, and look, I think you see this with uh, Javier Malay, right? Like this is the way it can be done. Like this is the way to do it is to tap into these, this, this kind of populist streak, particularly at a time when the elites have so mismanaged everything and kind of like talk to people about how they're being ripped off, how like how they're being ripped off and these guys are doing it to you. And then the, the problem with populism always is that it's completely devout of any type of theory. Trumpian movement in general. There's just no, it's it's always like he's railing against everything that is pretty horrible. And then he, it's like, so what's your thing? And it's like, good deals, make the best deals. Only me, only I can do. It's like, there's nothing really there. But libertarians already have that. It's like libertarians have all the theory, but we're missing all of the like populism to make it like appeal to, to people. So what do you think of that? Uh, that argument that, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, there are, uh, there, there is a sort of, you know, managerial elite, or at least, uh, 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 people who have that ambition to, uh, plan our society and that libertarians should be defining themselves in opposition to that agenda. I think a lot of things about that. Um, one is that I should uh, always preface that uh, my job uh, or my self-conception um, uh, is not about the wielding of political, the attainment or the wielding of political power. Uh, and so when I uh, am asked about, you know, how should we attain and wield political power? I don't have great answers, or at least you should take them with all the grain of salt. My job is to do journalism, uh, libertarian journalism. Um, uh, a lot of that can be very righteous and angry and frothing and pointing out the just brutal mismanagement by the elite political class. It's a huge percentage of what we do at Reason uh, and what I've done in my life before. And uh, I ever work for Reason or really knew much about the place. Um, so it's part of it. Yeah. But uh, also journalism is just a different thing. It's it's a, it's gathering of facts. I would point to if we're going to be talking about Marie Rothbard's strategy as being something that that is helpful, um, you should point out that um, it wasn't always helpful. The uh, Marie Rothbard went to some bad places in the early 1990s. Um, uh, th that is what happens when you go towards the attainment of political party and also uh, power and also like this sort of attempt. And and there's something elite about the this uh, attempt as well, or at least uh, not elite. It's it's like a it's a it's a temptation that intellectuals and people who work in the knowledge class um, always are tempted by, which is that if I can just harness this populist feeling out there, I'm going to produce my intellectual ideological outcome. Um, yeah. You see this with uh, with Marie Rothbard and Lou Rockwell in the early 1990s with the Roth Rockwell Rothbard report. Uh, they were talking about Joe Senator Joe McCarthy, tail gunner Joe, as being a role model. They were saying nice things about David Duke. Um, they cozied up to Pat Buchanan um, uh, at the time as a kind of predictive element of where a segment of the population was going to go as as a sort of John the Baptist figures. Uh, for Donald Trump, they were onto something, absolutely. And they were onto something much more than I certainly expected. So hats off for, you know, sort of like uh, describing a, a world as it exists rather than a world than I thought it was. Um, but as a, uh, a a place where a person can go um, and uh, and like and hold on to one's libertarianism or one's ideology, it was corrupting. Those types of things are corrupting. Uh, it's going to lead you to positions like Lou Rockwell had of like defending the cops against Rodney King, of uh, writing just really horrible things like the the early 1990s stuff that came 
uh, whether it's in the Ron Paul newsletters or the, or the Rothbard Rockwell report and all these kind of things. It's, it's very noxious. It's very anti-libertarian. Um, uh, it went to a bad place. Uh, and you could say that admiring Ro uh, uh, Rothbard for plenty of other things that he uh, contributed in his life. But he was always kind of a political schemer. Um, one way to look at this and take Rothbard and take libertarian politics out of this for a second is um, look at the difference between what, what Chris Rufo does and what, uh, uh, for instance, the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education does. They are always at loggerheads, even though they frequently have the same kind of uh, opponents in the world. It's just a different approach of uh, fire. Um, uses a they're sort of tethered to a set of principles which they apply hopefully uh, and in, in my uh, view uh, usually um, very consistently uh, across time. Rufo is is going towards power, um, political power like Ron DeSantis in Florida, and trying to influence it. I think both approaches are valid, by the way, and I think uh, like. Absolutely, Chris Rufo has influenced uh, American policy and debate more than a lot of private actors have for a long time. Um, but I think it is also corrupting. You're going to lead to bad laws, which I think some of that ha has happened in Florida. So um, it's uh, libertarian popular. I think libertarian is naturally populist in that sense. It is a, a position from which you critique the application of power and you correctly identify that especially those people who say that, oh, we're just over here like trying to solve problems, that that is actually ideological, even uh, as much or more ideologically or more influentially ideological than libertarianism is. And yeah, Javier Malay going afuera a bunch and ripping stuff off of a wall is awesome. I would love to see that as I would love to see someone uh, articulate in the way that he has in those videos that we've all seen talking about economics and just rapid fire insane you know, Nick Gillespie on, on crank, uh, kind of mode. That's, that's all thrilling and exciting, but let's also remember, um, the conditions that brought him, uh, were so horrible and I hope we don't live to see them in this country. Would it, yeah. Would and there's a, it's, it's also, it's also, t uh, you know, targeted at a, the, from a libertarian perspective, it's grounded. It, we talked about this with Dave too. It's grounded in libertarian theory. And he is, when he's, you know, saying afuera and, and ripping things off, he's talking about dismantling unnecessary government bureaucracies, which all of us in this conversation agree with. And like, when I think about populism, um, I, I, I agree largely with what you're saying, Matt, that there's a sort of cynicism to libertarians embracing it uh, because populism can almost be its own uh, ideology. It's like it is the belief that there is just that the elites um, themselves are kind of inherently bad. And I think for libertarians, it's like, well, no, it's more like people who are using their elite status to infringe on others' liberties are bad. Like in a, in a free society, there, you know, we would have, you know, academics and we would have, uh, you know, titans of industry and so forth. Like, so there, there would be kind of like natural el elites. So we're, we're not against that necessarily, but uh, we're against- Natural like, elites, Zach Weissmuller. Well, we're, we're against like- uh, you know, the Klaus Schwab's of the world, uh, who is himself defining uh, himself against libertarian. He, he said, you know, libertarians, these anti-system people are the enemy. Um, and so, you know, I, I have no problem being kind of like creeped out by like the, the dastardly plans of the World Economic Forum, even though I don't think that, you know, they're, they're out there, you know, eating babies uh, that, but they, they sure. want to, they 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 have a vision. They have the a kind of you know technocratic vision of the world. They have this this idea that um it, you know we're we're gonna kind of meld uh public and private, and we're we're you know have we're gonna have stakeholder capitalism. We're gonna kind of go the China model. That that is something to be alarmed about and worried about. And and to the degree that you know resisting that is quote unquote populism, fine. But this kind of unmoored populism and, and appealing to just like a, a in a vague sense of uh, the, the elites are are controlling everything. I, I think that is where we start to run into to big problems. Well, wouldn't libertarian populists counter to both of you? Because I, I do want to sort of play devil's advocate for a second here. I think I agree 
with what you guys are saying. But wouldn't the libertarian populists, if one were in the room with us, counter, Zach, they shut you inside your house in Los Angeles for you know, a, a really long time to the point where you felt the need to move your entire family to Florida to ensure your kids didn't grow up masked. Matt, you know, same for you in New York City. I mean, you have basically been betrayed by the state that has locked you inside your houses for many months on end and basically removed public schools as an option available to your children. What has the state done for you? And done Liz, yeah. and Liz, they blocked you from going to church. Right. Well, I yeah. Mean, I mean, legitimately, they blocked for a long people time. from going to church. That is yeah. such a radicalizing notion. I mean, just but for cutting a long them off time, the They did all of this to us. So then they basically said, you know, Matt and Liz, in order to possibly enter a New York City restaurant uh, with your family, you have to show proof that you've gotten the vaccine a bunch of times at a certain point, right? Because they required multiple doses. Oh, and then by the way, Zach, those questions you had about the origins of this whole virus and whether or not there was a lab leak, well, actually we're going to censor and suppress a whole bunch of information, journalistic information that attempts to get to the bottom of this, even though it's all happened in China, you know, where the CCP, sorry, I did my best Donald Trump ask China, but like where the CCP, More we know syllables. it's not generally transparent with us, right? Like, yeah. so when you, well, when you tally up what they've done to us over the last four or so years, not to mention every single year, they take hefty, hefty chunks of our paychecks. How could you not hate the state? Like at a well, certain point, give, you get yeah, radicalized? Let, well, it's not, yeah, it's, it's not about that. It, and let, uh, let me just give one counter to that. And I, I'm curious to hear Matt weigh in on this, but you know, when you talk about they, locked me down in Los Angeles. It was basically one person named Barbara Ferrer, who was the <laughs> public health authority uh, for LA County, who's like a, a, you know, a master's of public health or something like that. And then who was it that ultimately declared that, uh, you know, locking people out of their churches was unconstitutional? It was a bunch of robed elites from Ivy League, uh, from the Ivy League, uh, sitting on the Supreme Court. So it's not as simple as like the elites versus the non-elites are, are on your side or, or not on your side. And, and that's, I guess, my point is like we should be looking more at what is what are the mechanisms for these infringements rather than like what kind of strata of society or culture is it coming from? but i do think it is worth pointing out that like barbara farrar and you know big city mayors um whether garcetti or de blasio were all taking their cues from anthony fauci and then the teachers unions and randy weingarten who matt has written about extensively right like to some degree there was a level of uh coordination maybe not in the sort of sense that people envision of like well the deep state uh, is conspiring against us but there is certainly, uh, well, the CDC says one thing and Anthony Fauci says one thing, and then all of these big city mayors take their cues from that and so on and so forth. Matt, what do you make of all this? That um, is, I mean, I've always used the phrase political class in that in in many cases, and this is absolutely true. And it was a, an actual conspiracy in that people met together and made decisions. I mean, the, the classic case is the February 2021 new Biden administration guidelines at the CDC about distancing in, in public schools, uh, where the new uh, CDC director, Rochelle Walensky, made a recommendation that was counter to her own personal recommendation of the summer previously, when she was a private citizen, uh, because um, she had Randy Weingarten, president of the American Federation of Teachers, in on those scientific discussions. And since a huge swath of the country, the one run by Democrats for the most part, basically uh, followed CDC diktat on uh, these things that meant that sentenced kids to further time in halftime or remote schooling. And there was a revolt uh, that happened uh, in Massachusetts and elsewhere, and they had to scramble and revise those calculations a month later. Um, but it showed that that thing was was corrupted from from root and branch. And yes, the the Elites and this, and I would include here the journalistic class too, as part of the political class. Right now, you have a large swath of journalism dumb who are cheering on censorship by the Biden administration. Like we have to combat COVID mis misinformation, and if that means, you know, taking Joe Rogan off Spotify, well, darn it, that's just what we've got to do. It's insane, um, and we should have contempt towards that. Um, I would just say in my own little hippie corner over here, we just had Martin Luther King Day here, and I'm always glad to see people look up 
his various writings and speechings about everything. And, and I've always been, I think the perhaps greatest or certainly, you know, top five pieces of American uh, political writing and rhetoric is letter from Birmingham jail, which has the four steps, essential steps in his position or his, his point of view uh, uh, towards uh, creating a nonviolent campaign of, uh, of a nonviolent um, resistance. And uh, th two of those steps are always, uh, kind of overlooked, uh, but one of them is the uh, gathering of facts, right? Not fictions, but facts. Um, the other one is self-purification, um, which is to say, um, if your heart is filled with hate, you're going to do bad at, at at doing persuasive, convincing protest. So um, I have contempt for a lot of the actions that you described, Liz, and even you bringing them up again makes the blood pressure kind of go up and, and get all prickly. Um, and I try not to be governed by hate. I don't think uh, encouraging people to hate the state is going to lead to great outcomes, but that's just me personally. Um, and again, I'm not uh, in the power wielding business. Um, I know that if I'm governed by hate uh, of, you know, the protesters blocking the Williamsburg Bridge when I want to cross it, um, that I'm probably going to get to some bad policy ideas. So I try to not do it. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our new show, Just Asking Questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here. New episodes drop every week, so subscribe to Reason TV's YouTube channel to get notified when that happens, or to the Just Asking Questions podcast on Apple, Spotify, or any other podcatcher.